Hello, my name is Kara Kaikini and I'm a Freeport resident. I'm also a volunteer with the Arts and Cultural Alliance of Freeport. February is Black History Month. One Way ACAF and the Tri-Town Equity and Inclusion Coalition is celebrating with you is by sharing some children's stories about Black history or Black culture in America. This first one is called The Youngest Marcher, the story of Audrey Faye Hendricks, a young civil rights activist by Cynthia Levinson and illustrated by Vanessa Brantley Newton. I like this book because it's a moving story about a brave young girl who happens to be the same age as my oldest son who wanted to be part of a movement for civil rights, her parents who supported her, and the impact of speaking up for what you believe in. Whenever Mike flew into town, Audrey and her mama cooked. Barbecued ribs, stewed greens, sweet potato souffle, and Audrey's favorite, hot rolls baptized in butter. <clears throat> Other folks knew Mike as Martin or Dr. King. The Hendrixes used his nickname. They did the same with the other ministers too, like Fred Shuttlesworth and Jim Bevel. After Mike blessed the feast, Mama expected Audrey to keep still during supper. But when grown-ups talked about wiping out the segregation laws that kept black and white people apart in Birmingham, she just had to speak up. Audrey intended to go places and do things like anybody else. I want to eat my ice cream inside Newberry's. I want to sit downstairs at the Alabama. I don't want hand-me-down school books but stools at the counter, plush movie theater seats, books so fresh they'd crackle when you open them, those were for white children. Hush, hissed Mama. Nine-year-old children should not speak in front of company, especially ministers like Mike, Fred, and Jim, who were bringing dreams of justice. Audrey knew all about segregation. She knew to pay the driver at the front of the bus, then step off and walk around to the back door drink from the fountain with the dirty bowl and the warm water, use the freight elevator at department stores downtown. Front row seats, cool water, elevators with white gloved operators, laws said those were for white folks. Every Monday night, Audrey and her mama and daddy and her aunts, uncles, and cousins joined neighbors and friends at Fred's church for worship, fellowship, and testimony. She sang and swayed along with the movement choir, her voice spirited and spiritual. Black and white together we shall overcome. For once, she didn't have to keep still. Then came testimonies. White store owners won't hire me. Ku Kluxers chased me. Policemen called me names. The hateful stories made Audrey squirm. She tried to tell her mama, that's not right. Shh. How could mama expect her to hush? She had to make things right. But what could she do? When Mike visited Fred's church, thousands of people crowded around her to hear him preach. In a voice as taut as steel cables, as smooth as glass, he intoned, segregation is morally wrong and sinful. That's true. Fired up, Audrey sat taller. An unjust law is no law at all, he proclaimed. Audrey had listened to Mike explain his plan at her supper table and knew what he meant. If a law is unjust, disobey it. Sit down inside Newberry's. Pick at those white stores. March to protest those unfair laws. Why, even marching was against the law. Then, get arrested. Fill the jails, Mike exclaimed. Phil Birmingham's jail is so full that policemen can't squeeze in one more person. Pack cells so tight that police will have to quit arresting people for demanding their rights. Audrey just knew Mike's plan would work. She twisted in her pew to see which grown-ups would walk down the aisle, volunteer for jail. But they mostly stayed put, eyes staring at their feet, hands on their knees. Feet, hands, and knees didn't move. Fill the jails, Mike pleaded, meeting after meeting, but heads shook. All around her, Audrey heard, no, best not break those segregation laws. 
boss man will fire me. Landlord will evict me. Policeman will beat me. If nobody protested, Mike's plan would fail. Police could keep arresting anyone, anytime, for anything, forever. Audrey would never be able to go places and do things like everybody else. One night, Jim announced a new idea. If grown-ups won't do it, fill the jails with children. Audrey leaped to her feet. I want to go to jail, she declared. Mama looked deep and saw that Audrey's eyes begged, please. Okay, said Mama. Audrey strutted down that aisle. She was going to jail. <clears throat> Two mornings later, she put on a fresh press pinafore and shiny Mary Janes with turned down socks. Protesters got to look nice. In the meantime, her daddy brought her a game to help her pass the time in jail. Her mama and daddy took her by Center Street Elementary to tell her teacher she'd be absent, maybe for a whole week. Miss Willis, Miss Wills wrapped her arms around her. Audrey knew she was proud of her. She said goodbye to her grandparents. You'll be fine, her grandmother said. She knew Audrey would be brave. So did Audrey. Then her mama and daddy drove her to 16th Street Baptist Church where the children were gathering. Even before she reached the door, Audrey heard loud voices chanting freedom songs. <clears throat> Inside, hundreds of big kids called out to friends and crowded around signs for their high schools. Parker, Carver, her head swiveled. Was there a sign for Center Street Elementary? She was the only protester from her school, the youngest child in the whole church, and she knew no one. Audrey huddled by her parents in the basement. But when Jim lined her up with the others, two by two, and the doors swung open, Audrey straightened up. She was going to break a law and go to jail to help make things right. Clutching a protest sign in one hand and her game in the other, Audrey marched out the door. She stomped and sang, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Half a block from the church, a white policeman stopped Audrey. He pointed toward a police van. Sentence, one week in juvenile hall. A matron locked Audrey into a day room with two dozen other girls, all older, all bigger, all strangers. Audrey sat down alone and slipped the cover off her game. I told you to sit down, the matron yelled. Audrey jumped. She didn't remember standing up. The matron dragged her to a dark, empty room. When I tell you something, you do it, she commanded, or I'll leave you here. Trembling, Audrey quietly followed the matron back to the day room, put away her game, lay down her head, and cried. Jail was harder than she'd thought, and she wasn't fine after all. By evening, Audrey was hungry and tired. For dinner, soupy, oily, tasteless grits. At night, a bare mattress with one thin sheet for a cover. The next morning, uh-oh, no fresh underwear, no clean pinafore, no toothbrush. Audrey and her cellmates were let outdoors into an empty concrete pen surrounded by high prison walls. The older girls talked together. Audrey wondered what her classmates were doing. Miss Wills would be keeping them busy. On another day, Audrey was sent to a huge room and told to sit in a chair that was so high her feet dangled above the floor. Four white men glared at her. She'd never talked to a white man before. Are you against America? One demanded to know. No, sir, she answered politely. What do you talk about at those meetings? Asked another. Our freedom. Why did you march? To go places and do things like anybody else. What was wrong with that?
Every mealtime, Audrey stared at greasy grits. She could barely spoon them into her mouth, let alone swallow them. Every night, the cot's wire springs jabbed. Every morning, she had nothing to do but sit alone with her game. In the afternoons, though, more kids crowded into the day room. Some days, many of them arrived sopping wet. A girl explained that firemen aimed powerful hoses at the children. Surging water spun off them, spun them off their feet and down the street. They got up and kept marching anyway until they too were sent to jail. By Audrey's fifth day in detention, the police couldn't squeeze in one more person. We filled up all the rooms, we filled up all the rooms. Audrey practically jumped up and down. She was so proud. Watching television in the day room, she saw black people stroll straight into stores and restaurants like they belonged there. No one else could be sent to jail. Everything had changed. After seven days, Audrey went home. Her mama and daddy wrapped their arms tight around her, washed the jail off her, and for dinner, hot rolls baptized in butter. Two months later, the city of Birmingham wiped segregation laws clean off the books. Audrey licked her spoon clean at Newberry's counter like everybody else. Black and white together, like we belong. There's an author's note in here. There's a picture of Audrey as a child, probably right around the age when she was a marcher, the youngest marcher. They want to read this note. Every day Audrey Fay Hendricks spent in jail, her mother, Lola, called someone she knew there to make sure her daughter was safe. The day after her release, Audrey returned to Miss Will's class. She didn't tell her classmates about marching or jail, though. It didn't dawn on me that it was a big deal, she said. But it was. Audrey was one of more than 3,000 children who were arrested in Birmingham, Alabama in May 1963. The Children's March, which was planned by Reverend James Bevel, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., affected not only Birmingham, but America. That summer, young people held protests in nearly 200 cities. President John F. Kennedy spoke on television about prejudice and sent a civil rights bill to Congress. On August 28th, about 250,000 people marched in Washington, D.C. to hear Dr. King preach about his dreams of freedom. I had the honor of talking with Audrey in her home where she grew up. She showed me the table at which Dr. King blessed their meals and the upright piano where she practiced singing civil rights songs, including Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Round. Audrey told me that she remained an activist afterward. She volunteered to integrate a high school, enrolling as one of its first black students. It took a while for whites and blacks to work together, she said, but it was what we fought for. After graduating from college and working in Dallas, Texas, Audrey returned to Birmingham where she taught preschool and led Head Start programs. Years later, she earned a graduate degree researching women like her mother and herself who were involved in the civil rights movement. Schools around the country invited her to speak about her experience as the youngest known marcher. Nicknamed the civil rights queen, Audrey Faye Hendricks died in 2009. There's also a timeline and a recipe for hot rolls baptized in butter. Definitely a book to consider having, especially if you have children. Thank you and happy Black History Month. And please enjoy the rest of the books in our story series. Have a great day.